Greetings and blessings to you guys. I pray that you all are doing well. I pray that you all are blessed and prosperous on this wonderful day. Greetings and blessings to you all. God is truly worthy of the glory. He's truly worthy of the honor. He's truly worthy of the adoration. Listen, as you guys join, please let me know where you're viewing from. Please let me know your city, your state, your region, your country, your territory. Hallelujah. It's good to see each and every one of you here. I wanted to come on here and I just wanted to share the word of the Lord with you. I really believe that this is an issue and a topic that uh, we really need to address. And so I just want to speak to this issue from a biblical perspective and provide you with a clear and concise biblical strategy uh, that will empower uh, you to stay in a place of freedom from any type of seduction, lust, or anything of that nature. Amen. So greetings and blessings to you all. Please do me a favor, share this broadcast, share it with your friends, your family members, your loved ones, share it on your pages, all that good stuff. Invite people to join um, to receive the word of the Lord. Now, uh, as we enter into this time of teaching, greetings and blessings to you from Texas. I see you. From Ohio, I see you. It's glad to see you here. Marichuas, it's good to see you. Good to see you from that uh, very, very unique region of the world. Awesome, awesome. So listen, so as we enter into this time of teaching, um, one thing that I would like for you to do is just take a moment and just set your heart and your mind on the Lord. Just take a moment and just begin to focus on Him. Take a moment and just begin to posture your heart in a position, in a way to where you can receive the word of the Lord. We have to understand the importance and the power of posture. Posture has the way to bring us, or posture has the ability rather, to bring us into a place of divine breakthrough and divine encounter. Greetings and blessings to you from Fort Worth, Texas. Good to see you, Evangelist Kate. So our posture plays a vital role in our ability to receive from God. Our posture plays a vital role in our ability to encounter God. Our posture plays a vital role uh, in our ability uh, to enter into a place of greater revelation, a place of greater wisdom, a, a place of greater insight. All right, Our posture plays a role in so many things uh, in life, both spiritually and naturally. And so I just want you to just set your heart and your mind on God. And just begin to meditate on his goodness begin to meditate on his kindness begin to meditate on his uh, faithfulness greetings and blessings to you from knoxville it's good to see you cheryl good to see you so just set your hearts and your minds on him we're going to enter into a time of prayer and then we're going to jump right in here thank you all for joining on this wonderful evening so father in jesus name we honor you we reverence you we magnify you we lift you up god we thank you for your faithfulness we thank you for your faithfulness, for you are forever faithful, for you are forever faithful to your word, you're forever faithful to your promises, for you are the one who always causes us to triumph, you are the one who always ensures that we never suffer defeat, that we're never overtaken by wickedness, evil, or the evil one. Father, I pray in Jesus' name that you'd forgive us of our sins, that you would cleanse us. I pray, God, that you would touch the hearts and minds of your people even now. I pray that you would breathe upon them. I pray, God, that you would touch them on the inside. Deal with the hardened hearts in the name of Jesus. I pray, Lord God, that you would open the eyes of our understanding, that we would see with clarity everything that you desire for us to see, know, and comprehend in your word, Lord God. Father, I pray in Jesus' name that you would help us to be strong in you, that we be strengthened and empowered by your word and the revelation that proceeds forth from your word. Word. Holy Spirit, I pray that you would open our eyes that we would see, open our ears that we would hear so that we can comprehend everything that you desire to deposit and invest into us. In the name of Jesus, I bind and rebuke now the schemes and the plans of the enemy to keep the people of God, to keep your people in a place of bondage, in a place of captivity. I declare and decree that no form of perversion would be able to continue to keep your people in this holding pattern, in this place of dysfunctional living, in this place of mixture. Father, in Jesus' name, I pray that there would be a wave of purity that would be released among your people now in the name of Jesus. I pray, God, that there would be a wave of purity that would be released among the hearts and the minds of your people now in the name of Jesus Christ. In the name of Jesus, a wave of purity, a wave of purity. Purify us, Lord God. Purify our appetites. Purify our motives. Purify the posture of our hearts. Help us to know and understand that everything that we encounter, it starts with the condition of our minds. It starts with the, the condition of our appetites. Help us, Lord God, to guard our hearts, Lord God. In the name of Jesus, Father, I pray now that even as we enter into this time of teaching, I pray, God, that your fire, the fire of the Holy Ghost will begin to move now. 
burning, purifying, purging in the name of Jesus Christ. Listen, just right where you are, just lift your hands to God for a moment and just begin to ask God to purify you. Lift your hands to God and just say, Lord, purify me. Come on, lift your hands to him and say, Lord, purify me. Lord, purify me. Lord, purify me on the inside. Lord, purify my mind. Lord, pu Lord, Lord, purify my mind. Purify my thoughts. Lord, purify my appetites. Lord, purify me. Purify me. Come on, let that be your, your, your cry to him. Let that be your prayer to him. Ask him to purify you. Ask him to purify you. And when you begin to pray, God will begin to touch you. You will begin to feel the tangible presence of the Lord. You begin to feel his presence beginning to move on the inside of you. In the name of Jesus, Holy Spirit, I thank you for breathing upon them. I thank you for touching them now. I thank you for touching them now. I thank you for moving. I thank you for moving in them now. In the name of Jesus, I thank you for moving, for moving in their hearts, for moving in their minds. I thank you for purifying. I thank you for cleansing. I thank you for purifying. I thank you for cleansing now, God. I thank you for doing a new thing on the inside of them now, in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus. Father, in Jesus' name, I thank you now for the victory that's being released even now. Victory over sexual temptation, victory over lust, victory over perversion. I bind and rebuke now any interferences of the enemy, where the enemy would seek to sabotage this moment of breakthrough and deliverance in the lives of your people, in the lives of those that view this broadcast. Father, I pray, Lord God, that this will be a divine encounter of healing, a divine encounter of breakthrough and deliverance that would change their lives forever in Jesus Christ's mighty name. Holy Spirit, I pray that you would find expression in and through me, that you would manifest yourself as you see fit according to your perfect will in Jesus Christ's mighty name. And God, we honor you and we bless you. In Jesus' name, we pray and give thanks to God. And we say, amen. Amen. Hallelujah. So listen, I want to share something with you. Um, first and foremost, freedom from sexual uh, sin, uh, freedom from... Uh, perversion, lust, and all those things, this is something that's on the heart and mind of God, okay? Uh, the reason why this is on the heart and mind of God um, is because it's God's will that you walk in sanctification, okay? It's God's will that you are sanctified, all right? So I want to show this to you foundationally uh, in the context of Scripture, all right? God does not intend nor does He desire for you to continue to live life as if uh, you do not know Him. God does not continue for any, God does not desire for any of his people to live life uh, as if they are in a backslidden condition or if they are in a sinful condition or if they are in a place where their lives are dominated by fleshly living and fleshly gratification. That's not God's will for your life. God's will for your life is sanctification. I want to show this to you in the text of scripture. First Thessalonians chapter number four, verse number three says this. First Thessalonians chapter four, verse number three says this. For this is the will of God. Somebody say the will of God. Your sanctification. Okay, so the sanctification is God's will for all of his people. So again, this is Paul writing here. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 3. He says, for this is the will of God, your sanctification, that you should abstain from sexual immorality, that each of you should know how to possess his own vessel in sanctification and honor not in passion of lust like the gentiles who do not know god that no one should take advantage of and defraud his brother in this matter because the lord is the avenger of all such as we also forewarn you and testify for god did not call us to uncleanness but in holiness therefore he who rejects this message or he who rejects this does not reject man but god who has also given us his Holy Spirit. So I want to unpack this, this scripture here. So the Apostle Paul starts out, greetings and blessings to you all as you join. He says, this is what the will of the Lord is, your sanctification. So let's pause right here for a moment. Let's take a look at the meaning of the word sanctification here in the text. When we think about sanctification, we have to understand that sanctification first and foremost uh, is one of the phases of salvation. So when you think about uh, salvation there are three basic phases the first phase or the first thing that happens uh, when a person is saved um, is that they go through justification meaning that when you place your faith in Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord you are justified by your faith in Jesus Christ and the finished works of Jesus Christ on the cross so therefore the blood of Jesus works on your behalf and establishes you as the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus so the blood of Jesus declares you upright both spiritually and morally 
but then you have to go through a process called sanctification which is the second part or the second phase of salvation and then there's glorification so when you think about the context of sanctification that deals with the saving of the soul salvation in its most simplistic meaning and definition means deliverance okay so when a person is saved the first phase of their deliverance comes by way of justification meaning that you are now delivered from the kingdom of darkness and the slavery of sin and you are now brought into a place of right standing with God and you're translated from one kingdom which is the kingdom of darkness into God's marvelous light all right and we see that in first Peter chapter 2 verse 9 okay now um when you think about sanctification, that's a phase of salvation that deals with your soul. Because remember, man is comprised of three parts. Uh, man is a, and that's called being a tripartite being. So that means that man possesses, a man is a spirit being that possesses a soul and lives in a physical body. Okay? So the salvation of your spirit happens when you exercise your faith in Christ. That's justification. The salvation of your soul happens through sanctification. The salvation of the body happens through glorification. That's when you are now given uh, incorruptible bodies, okay? Now that comes at a future time at the great and glorious appearing of Jesus Christ. Titus chapter 2 uh, verses 11 through 15 shine some light and revelation on that. All right, now when we look at this in the context of sanctification in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 verse 3. All right, so the word sanctification here uh, in the text is the word hagiosmos, all right? And it means to be morally uh, pure or, or it means to be in a state of moral uh, purity or sanctity. Okay. It means to be uh, in a state or condition of holiness. All right. So the word sanctification, the word hagiosmos um, is a derivative of the word hagiazo. Okay. Which is also uh, a word that means to make holy or to render holy holy it means to separate from profane things and to dedicate to god all right so when we accept jesus christ as our savior and lord we have to understand that the reason why sanctification is the will of god for his people is because god has called us to be separate from profane things god has called us to be separate from corruptible things god has called us to be separate from wicked things He's called us to be separate from fleshly, earthly things, okay? So that's a part of your calling. This is why in the latter parts of the scripture in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, uh, the Apostle Paul, he says that we were called to holiness. In verse number 7, he says, For God hath not called us unto uncleanness, but unto holiness, okay? So when you think about this, even the word holiness here in this text is the word hagiosmos. Watch this, which is the same word as sanctification, which reveals that there is a form of, um, uh, uh, of, of textual or contextual consistency here that's being revealed in the scripture that lets us know that sanctification produces holiness. Therefore, God is holy. Sanctification produces holiness. This is the will of God. Okay, to be separated from things that are profane uh, and things that will end up causing us to be contaminated or defiled. So in other words, I want you to look at it from this premise. Jesus did not die on the cross so that we can stay or remain in a place of defilement. I want you to think about that. Jesus did not die on the cross so that we can remain in a place of sin. Jesus did not die on the cross so that we can be uh, redeemed and saved from the penalty of sin uh, but somehow we, we've been given a, a pass and we can continue to live in sin. That, that's not the way that this works. See, when we accept Christ as our Savior and Lord, we enter into a covenant relationship with the Word. So we have to understand that Jesus is the Word incarnate. Jesus is the Word in flesh. And so if we enter into a relationship with the Word, the living Word, it means that we now have to enter into a covenant relationship with the written Word of God. And so you can't enter into a relationship uh, with the word incarnate, but not have a relationship with the written word of God. The two don't mix. That's a contradiction. And so when we enter into a relationship with Jesus Christ, we have to understand uh, that not only is he our savior, but he's also our Lord. When we have that understanding and we view Jesus from the premise of him being our savior and him being our Lord, we are now viewing things according to God's will. We have to understand the Lordship, the principle of the Lordship of Christ. The principle of Jesus' Lordship uh, determines or establishes the fact that he is the dispossessor of our lives, meaning that he is the one who has rulership or ownership of our bodies. He is the one who owns the rights to our lives. He is the one who then has the sole authority to dictate and determine the way that we are to use our bodies. Jesus is the author and the finisher of our faith. 
we didn't create a saving faith. We don't have the power to save ourselves apart from God. If man had the power to save themselves apart from God, then God would not have needed to come into flesh or to step into time in order to undo or in order to reverse those things that were lost during the original sin of man, during the original sin of Adam. And so because of God's great love and his mercy, he saw that it was fit. He saw that this was the only way that he could get that God could be just and punish sin while also saving and redeeming his creation that he loves. So God saved you because he loves you and because he loves you, he wants you to live a life of sanctification because he loves you. He wants you to live a life above sin because he loves you. He has given you the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit will empower you to overcome the lust of the flesh. So because God loves you, he's made provision for you and I to exercise victory over the flesh, over sexual perversion, over sexual immorality. So in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 verse 3 he says, for this is the will of God even your sanctification that ye should abstain from fornication now fornication is a common word that's used for sexual immorality but then he says in verse 4 he says that every one of you should know how to possess his vessel how in sanctification and honor now doesn't that sound familiar think back to romans chapter 12 verses 1 and 2 and the apostle paul says I beseech you therefore brethren by the mercies of God that you present what your bodies as a living sacrifice holy and acceptable unto God holy and acceptable unto God which is your reasonable service right and then he says do not be conformed to the pattern of this world but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may be able to test and to prove uh, that that good and perfect and acceptable will of God so living sacrifices as believers that's who we are but the way that we live our lives is in a way of sanctification and honor so we can't say that we're presenting ourselves to God as a living sacrifice, but we're not living in sanctification and honor. We can't say that we're presenting our, our, ourselves as these pure uh, sacrifices that, watch this, are holy and acceptable. That reveals to us that God has the right to reject a sacrifice. God has the right to reject a sacrifice. How do we know this? When you look at the biblical account of Cain and Abel, you will see where God rejected a sacrifice that he saw or he deemed as being unfit. So that means that God has the right to reject the sacrifices that we are offering. God has the right to reject things that we are offering to him that are not holy, that do not meet his standards. It doesn't mean that God doesn't love you, but it means that God will rebuke you and let you know that, hey, you're living in sin and you need to get it right. And he will give you the grace and the power to overcome that. He will send people into your life to teach you. He will send people into your life to reveal things to you. He will speak to you directly and give you warnings and, and give you opportunities to correct yourself. That's the ministry of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit ministers to each and every one of us in a way to where he brings conviction to us, to where he reminds us of who we are in Christ. The Holy Spirit brings conviction upon us and, and convicts us of sin, righteousness, and judgment. The Holy Spirit convicts us in a way to where now we have to make a choice to either partner with the will of God or to continue to buck against the system. It would be in your best interest as a believer to submit to the Lord. Because if we find ourselves in a place where we are trying to fight against God, that's a losing battle every time. Historically, throughout the text of scripture, there has never been a person that has been able to successfully fight against God. Look at Pharaoh, for example. He thought that he could fight against God. The wicked Pharaoh of Egypt that enslaved the Israelites. He thought that he could fight against God. His heart was so hardened, he thought that he was bigger than God. But guess what? He lost. So it, we, it's in our best interest to submit to our master, to submit to our Lord and follow his way because his way is what's best for you. All right. So verse number five, he says, not in the, not in, uh, the lust. I'm going to go to a different translation because I don't like the way that's written. Um, so I'm going to read it in a way to where you can understand it. So I'm going to read it from the NKJV. All right. So verse number five, he says, not in the passion of lust like the Gentiles who do not know God. Now, the term Gentile there is, in, is, a, is a reference to uh, those who are unsaved. Sometimes you see the term Gentile uh, used in scripture to reference those who are outside of a Jewish ethnicity. But then there are times where it can also mean a heathen or a pagan. All right. So in this context, he's saying like the Gentiles who do not know God. This is speaking of unbelievers here. So he says that it, the Apostle Paul is revealing to us that it's God's will that we are sanctified because when we are sanctified, we know how to possess. We learn how to possess our bodies. That deals with the stewardship of the body. 
That means that you and I have a responsibility to be faithful stewards over our bodies in every area. That includes our health. Now I know contextually here, this is dealing with sexual immorality. But we have to understand that God has required that we are faithful stewards over our body. That deals with our health, that deals with sexual immorality, that deals with the way that we care for ourselves and so many other things. So the principle of stewardship concerning your body is being revealed here contextually in the context of sexual immorality. All right, sexual purity. All right, so then he goes on in verse number six and he says that no one should take advantage and defraud his brother in this matter because the Lord is the avenger of all such as we also forewarned you and testified. Verse seven, for God did not call us to uncleanness but in holiness. Therefore, he who rejects this does not reject man but God who has also given us his Holy Spirit. Now, when the apostle Paul says who has also given us his Holy Spirit. He's revealing two things here. The Holy Spirit as the power that enables us to live upright and the Holy Spirit as the source of authority that validates the words that he is revealing here in this passage of scripture. So when he says, whoever rejects this does not reject man, but God. That's a very, very serious statement that he's making here. This is something that we need to take serious. When we reject the word of God, in any fashion, when we reject a man of God or a woman of God who is teaching the word of God in any fashion, we're not rejecting that individual. We are rejecting God because the written word of God is an extension of God's character. How do we know this? It's an extension of God's essence. It's an extension of God. We know this because the Bible makes it known to us that all scripture was given by the inspiration of God, meaning that it was God breathed. It came from the mouth of God. And so the scriptures that we read in the Bible, they were written by the inspiration. Holy men were inspired to write as the spirit of the Lord moved them. In the same way that holy men were inspired to prophesy as they were moved by the spirit of God, holy men were also inspired to write the scriptures as the spirit of the Lord began to influence them, as the spirit of the Lord began to move upon them and move within them. So the word of God is God breathed. It's truth, it's righteousness, it's pure, it's perfect. The law of the Lord is perfect. There is no error in God. And so because there is no error in God, there is no error in his word because his word is an extension or a manifestation of his nature. It's the manifestation of his deity, of his heart, his mind, his power, his love, his grace, his wisdom, his insight, his healing faculties, all of these things and so much more. All of these treasures are found in the word of God. So when we reject the preaching of sound doctrine, we are rejecting God directly because you have to understand that the man of God and the woman of God that's standing before you, that's sharing the word of God with you, they were sent there on an assignment by God. They are called and commissioned by God to function in whatever ministerial capacity, grace or office that God has called them to. And so when you buck against the system, you are not bucking against man, you are bucking against God. Now is the time where I believe very strongly that God is awakening his people to righteousness once again. Now is the time where I believe that God is awakening his people uh, to a place of greater consecration, to a place of greater sacrifice, to a place of greater pursuit, a place of greater longing. Now let's talk about this a little bit deeper here in the context of sexual immorality. What are some examples of sexual immorality? Of course we have fornication. What is fornication? Fornication is sex outside of marriage. Very simple. That's fornication. All right. Now, when we think about fornication, this can happen to anyone. Okay. Any any person can find themselves in that place if they do not safeguard their heart. All right. When you think about other forms of sexual immorality, you have adultery. All right. So adultery uh, contextually deals with um, sleeping, having sexual intercourse with uh, another married person. Okay. That's adultery. Okay. So sex. Uh, adultery occurs when when people are married and you have sex outside of your marital covenant or uh, when a person is single and they have sex with someone that's married you have just committed adultery because you violated a marital covenant by way of sexual intercourse okay and so when you look at this that so you're committing adultery with that person you're committing the act of adultery with that person if that makes sense all right uh, now I'm gonna show you something else in scripture where Jesus also speaks to adultery but in a spiritual context all right adultery in the context of the heart now i want you to understand other types of sexual morality you have pornography okay pornography there are many people that are bound by pornography many people that are bound by pornography because of the fact that the eye gate uh, is is something that is so um 
how can I how can I put this our eyes are easily captivated by what we see our eyes are easily captivated by what we see Jesus said that the eye is the lamp of the body right so if the eye is a lamp of the body that reveals that the eye gate it functions as a gate meaning an access point to the heart so if the eye is a lamp of the body that reveals to us that the eye has the ability through sight through things that we look at through optical faculties our hearts can now be filled with things so if we're looking at pornographic imagery that is sexually illicit content content that is generated through a digital or virtual space that's pornography when you're looking at these things uh, in, a, in a digital space what ends up happening is that now you are creating idols in your mind because the imagery that you're looking at now becomes an idol because you end up worshiping the imagery which then causes you to participate in illicit sexual activity whether it's alone and you're by yourself and you're indulging in different forms of self gratification or if you are finding yourself in a place where now you and the person that you're married with the two of you are now engaging in pornographic imagery you're viewing these things and now you have believed the lie of the enemy that watching these things will somehow spice up your sex life and 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 intensify uh, your intimacy that's a lie from hell you don't need to watch those things this is for married people you don't need to watch those things in order for your sex life to be enhanced you don't need to watch those things in order for you to grow in intimacy in a, in a, in a physical context in the confines of marriage you don't need to watch those things because true marital intimacy in a physical context it begins apart from the physical act of sexual intercourse true intimacy is built throughout relationship that you have with the person that you're with anyway that's a teaching for a different day but we have to look at this so when a person begins to view pornographic imagery what ends up happening is that now you create an idol and so the imagery that you watch it causes you to now objectify men or women because there are men that view pornography and there are women that view that view pornography and then when you look at the different types of pornography it feeds the sensual nature it feeds a demonic appetite on the inside of a person that can cause the person to be opened up to being possessed by a demon of lust to be possessed by a demon of perversion okay this can happen these are real things all right and so when we begin to indulge in those types of things we now create an appetite we are now training ourselves to crave after things that are off limits we're, we're, we're training ourselves to crave after things that God has said are sinful and forbidden I want to talk about the imagery here for a moment my spiritual father he, he was teaching one time and he talked about the principle of the hologram right and so the hologram in the context of uh, pornographic imagery what happens a lot of times is that when people consistently view pornography they end up finding themselves in a place where now the stuff that they watch they be it begins to infiltrate their dreams and now that these things begin to infiltrate their dreams they begin to see these hologram these, these holograms uh, that are appearing in their dreams in other words what happens is that the imagery that they've watched the demons there are spirits that inhabit the imagery that you are watching by way of pornography and those spirits will then try to perform sexual activity in your sleep this is not something that's far-fetched everything when you look at this it deals with idol worship okay there are there are different spirits if I had time I could really really break it down but there are different spirits that govern these different types of activities and things of that nature all right so these things are dangerous when you think about the framework of social media in this present day and age you look at the context of the reels you look at the context of TikTok. you look at the way that Instagram and social media are, are currently operating the majority of the things that are on there is are, are things that are sensual seductive and perverse that's the majority of the content that is funneled through reels so if a, just imagine if a person is spending two hours a day and they're watching reels what are they exposing themselves to what are they what are they opening their eyes to so we have to do a better job of guarding our eyes if we want to guard our hearts some of the warfare that many of you are experiencing internally it comes because you have set your gaze upon perverse things it comes because the more that you watch something that is illicit in nature you become desensitized to the spiritual nature and the spiritual consequences of such things you become desensitized so the enemy is literally lulling many people to sleep uh, by way of social media 
by way of reels, by, by way of viewing these things in, in a digital space. People are being lulled asleep. People are being fed lies. People are being fed deception because the enemy will speak to you and tell you, oh, it's, it's harmless. Oh, you're a mature Christian. You can handle that. You're, you're a mature. Just, just go and pray afterwards. You'll be okay. Listen, it doesn't work that way. Do not believe. The Bible says in Romans chapter 13, verse 14, put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to fulfill its lust. We make provision for the flesh when we create space, time, and opportunity for the flesh to be gratified in our lives. That's how we make provision for the flesh. We make provision for the flesh by watching things that we know are outside of God's will, by going into spaces that we know that God has said do not go into, by conversing, watch this, with people that you know the Lord has been dealing with you about. When you know the Lord has been, has been unctioning you and saying, eh, don't talk to that person because there's something off within that person and there's possibly something off with you that can cause you to now be enticed to engage in, in conversation or interaction with that person that has nothing to do with God whatsoever, but everything to do with fleshly gratification. God wants you delivered and set free. God wants us delivered and set free. God wants his church delivered and set free from these types of things. Other forms of sexual immorality. You have bestiality, that's sexual intercourse with animals. You have various forms of, of, of homosexual activity, lesbianism, all of those things. These things are, are different forms of explicit sexual interactions. It's sexual immorality, orgies, threesomes, all these things, sexual immorality. And there's, there's, there's tons more, but these are like the basic ones uh, that we see throughout scripture and the ones that we see materialize uh, in, you know, in, in the world around us. So God doesn't want his people to participate in those things. That's not God's will for your life. We have to understand that when, if we as believers begin to dedicate ourselves to participating in such behavior, we are now mixing that which is holy with that which is profane. And when you mix something that is holy with something that is profane, it produces perversion. Somebody say perversion. It produces perversion. Let me give you some examples of mixture. Just imagine this, sensuality mixed with worship. Imagine a sensual worship leader, a seductive worship leader, whether it's male or female. Imagine a prideful prophet. Imagine someone that's prideful that can operate in the gifts of miracles or the gift of prophecy or any spiritual gift. Imagine someone that's arrogant that can operate in the gift of word of knowledge. Imagine someone being a manipulator, but they can operate freely and, and fluently in the gift of word of wisdom. Imagine a person who is a slanderous individual, a person who is always gossiping, but they're, they're leading intercessory prayer. That's mixture. I mean, there's so many things I can name, but there's mixture. So when you mix something that's profane with something that's holy, it produces perversion. More than likely, the perversion comes by way of seduction and by way of deception. 1 Corinthians chapter number 6. Is this blessing you? 1 Corinthians chapter number 6 verses 12 through 20 says this. The Apostle Paul is speaking here and he says, All things are lawful for me, but all things are not helpful. The King James Version says, All things are lawful, but all things do not edify. Meaning that all things do not build you up spiritually or naturally. You have the right to indulge in things uh, by way of your, 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 your own volition, if you will. You can choose to do whatever you want. You can choose to participate in things. You can choose to partake of things. But you have to know that all things do not bring edification. Okay? That's first and foremost. He then goes on to say, All things are lawful for me, but I will not be brought under the power of any. Foods for the stomach and the stomach for foods. But God will destroy both it and them. Now the body is not for sexual immorality, but for the Lord. And the Lord for the body. The body is not for sexual immorality, but for the Lord. I want you to say that out loud. I want you to confess this over yourself. Say, my body is not for sexual immorality, but for the Lord. Take a moment right here. Pause and make that confession. Decree that over yourself. Say, my body is not for sexual immorality, but for the Lord. And the Lord for the body. 
meaning that your body belongs to God. God has a unique purpose for your body. All right. The text goes on to say, and God both raised up the Lord and will also raise us up by his power. Now that's talking about resurrection in the future. He goes on to say, do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them members of a harlot? Certainly not. Or do you know that he who is joined to a harlot is one body with her? For the two, he says, shall become one flesh. But he who is joined to the Lord is one spirit with him. Flee sexual immorality. Now let's pause right there for a moment. He says, do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? We are members of the body of Christ. He says, should I take the members of Christ, meaning your body, and join them in a sexually illicit context with a harlot? He says, certainly not. So what the Apostle Paul is revealing here is that when we indulge in sexual uh, perversion, we are misusing God's blueprint, God's purpose, God's original design and purpose for our bodies. We are taking literally the members of the body of Christ and merging them with something that is profane. That's not God's will for you. He says, certainly not. God forbid. That's not his will for you and I. Or do you not know that he who is joined to a harlot is one body with her? He says, now, for the two, he says, shall become one flesh. This is a reflection to what the Lord said in Genesis concerning man and woman, concerning marriage uh, and, and procreation. Okay? So the two shall become one flesh. When you have sexual intercourse with a person, you become one flesh with them. You become one flesh with them. That establishes a yoke. That establishes a unity, a type of unity. It establishes a type of tie between you and that person. This is where we get the context of soul ties. Because you have to think of the soul. The soul is comprised of uh, the mind, the will, the emotions, the intellectual faculties, all of those things. All of those things are intertwined in the soul. Okay? And so when you think about that, when you come together... And you're having intercourse with a person. Let's think about this in the context of marriage. When you have a husband and a wife that come together in the context of marriage, there is a merging. There is a fusion that occurs. There is a type of chemistry that is established between those two individuals. Okay? And so when you think about this, there is a transference where different things are being deposited from person to person based upon the aspect of coming together. Yes, it's like a covenant that is established between you and that person. That's exactly what it is. Because in the in what, what Paul is referencing here when he says the two shall become one flesh, he's speaking of the principle of covenant. You establish a covenant of being one flesh with a person based upon sexual intercourse. So just imagine a person that's having all these, these different sexual partners that they're sleeping with. You're establishing covenants with each one of these, per, each one of these people by way of sexual intercourse. It's a dangerous thing. It's outside of God's will. Okay? So we have to avoid those types of things. He says, he goes on to say, But he who is joined to the Lord is one spirit with him. As a believer, you are joined to the Lord. As a member of the body of Christ, you are joined to the Lord. So because you're joined to the Lord, that now makes you one spirit with God. That means that your spirit and the spirit of God is one. Your spirit and the spirit of God have been united together as one spirit. It's right here in the scriptures. So think about this. God is holy. This is why God says, be holy for I am holy. Why? When the apostle Paul is teaching on this, when the apostles are, are revisiting this principle that was revealed in the Old Testament, they're speaking to it in, a new, in this New Testament, in this dispensation that we're living in now. They're speaking to it to reveal to us and make known to us that God is holy. You're in relationship with him. You are joined to the Lord. You are one spirit with the Lord. Therefore, be holy. Why? Because he is holy. You can't say that you're in relationship with God. You can't say that you're joined to God, but you're living life apart from his nature apart from his character apart from his essence you and i are carrying the dna of god you and i are carrying the life of christ on the inside of us you are carrying the life of the godhead on the inside of your body that's what you're carrying so you have to understand that if you're carrying god on the inside of you 
You are carrying the DNA of God. You're carrying the power of God, the wisdom of God, the intelligence of God, the love of God, the grace of God, the power of God. Out of your belly shall flow rivers of living water. The living water is a manifestation of the Spirit of God flowing through you in an unrestricted fashion, in a multifaceted manner. There are multifaceted streams. There are multi-dimensional streams that begin to flow and emanate from your belly that deals with the seat of the appetite, that deals with the seat of the, of the soul of man, the spiritual component, the spiritual essence of who you are. Out of your belly shall flow rivers of living water. It's God's will that life, His life, flows in and through you. That's God's will. But watch this. The life of God will not be able to flow in and through us if we are living a life that's rooted in perversion and sin. Sin wages war against sanctification. Carnality wages war against sanctification. Carnality functions to prevent you from being sanctified. Sin functions to prevent you from being sanctified. Sanctified deals with the salvation and the deliverance of your soul. Our soul needs to be delivered because prior to us coming into a relationship with Jesus Christ, all we knew was sin. All we had an appetite for was sin. We didn't have an appetite to please God. We didn't have an appetite to live upright before God. We didn't have an appetite to serve God. We just wanted to gratify the fleshly impulses and the fleshly nature. So our souls need to be delivered and sanctified. So the deliverance of the soul comes through sanctification. So when believers fight against sanctification, you're fighting against your deliverance. You're fighting against the deliverance of your soul, meaning that you are fighting against God's desire and ability to forcefully drive out demonic systems, demonic power, demonic uh, tendencies and habits and natures and influences that seek to operate in and through you. So why fight against the process of sanctification? It's better to just submit to God and obey. He says, flee sexual immorality. Flee. Flee. To flee sexual immorality means that you are running for your life. You are running for your life because you are fleeing from something knowing that your life depends on it. He says flee sexual immorality. Every sin that a man does is outside the body, but he who commits sexual immorality sins against his own body. Or do you not know that your body, watch this, is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God and you are not your own? For you were bought at a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Now let's ask ourselves this question. He says you were bought with a price. What was the price that you were purchased with? What was the price that was paid to purchase your redemption? The simple answer is the blood of Jesus. The blood of Jesus functioned in a way to deliver you by way of redemption. The context of redemption means that you were delivered from slavery. Your freedom from slavery was purchased through the blood of Jesus. Therefore, the one who put down the down payment or the payment rather for your freedom from slavery now owns the rights to your body. So Jesus liberated us by the payment of his blood so that we can live for him. Jesus didn't liberate us or redeem us by the payment of his blood so that we can remain in the same in the same unregenerate condition Jesus gave himself he died so that we can be set free and walk in and experience the abundant life that he came to give us he said I have come that you may have life and life more abundantly the abundant life is found in the prosperity of a person's spirit the prosperity of your soul the prosperity of your body all of these things are found in the abundant life that God has for you the abundant life of Christ is one that is filled with blessings the abundant life of Christ is one that is found or one that is rooted in freedom from perversion freedom from sin one that gives you access to unrestricted power one that gives you access to the unrestricted love of God the unfailing love of God the never-ending love and grace of God that's the abundant life it's life overflowing it's a life that, that is filled and charged by the Spirit of God. It's a life that is empowered and rooted in the Spirit of God. Your new identity in Jesus Christ. 
That's the abundant life. It's a life of freedom, a life of victory, a life of wholeness, a life of purity, a life of healing, a life of breakthrough. For some of you, you have been seeking the Lord and asking him to deliver you. And I come to proclaim to you that your deliverance is here. For some of you, you've been seeking the Lord and you've been saying, Lord, I'm tired of dealing with this same condition. And the Lord wants you to know that he has come to deliver you and set you free. But you have to deal with and identify the issues in your soul, the wounds in your soul, the wounds in your mind, the wounds in your will, the wounds in your emotion, those things that are functioning in a way to cause you to gravitate to things that are designed to kill you. The flesh functions in a way to kill you. The flesh functions in a way to seduce you and entice you. The word seduce means to persuade to disobedience or disloyalty. The word seduce, it means to persuade to disobedience or disloyalty. It means to lead astray, usually by persuasion or false promises. To lead astray by persuasion or false promises. To seduce also means the enticement of a person to sexual intercourse. It means to entice or to charm. Now, the interesting thing about the word charm, the word charm means to spell. It means to, to spell cast or to, uh, to cast a spell on, on someone or to bewitch them. Okay? So when you think about seducing words, seducing spirits, doctrines of devils, things of that nature, it deals with spell casting. It deals with bewitchment. It deals with enchantment. So the flesh functions in a way to literally bring us into a place of deception by way of charm, bewitchment, or enchantment. This is why we need the Holy Spirit, because the Holy Spirit is the spirit of truth that leads us into all truth. Therefore, when you are led by the Spirit of God, you will always overcome any form of deception that can ever be launched against you. Because the Spirit of God is the highest form of intelligence in existence. The Holy Spirit is God, 100% God. That's who's living on the inside of you. I want to show you something regarding adultery. According to Jesus' perspective. Greetings and blessings to you all as you join. It's good to see you, Sola. Matthew chapter 5, verses 27 through 30 says this. You have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not commit adultery. Now, Jesus is referring to the law here. Ten commandments specifically. But I say to you that whoever looks at a woman to lust for her, has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Now watch this. Although the text says a woman, I want to make it known to you that this applies to men as well, whoever, or, or it applies to women as well in the context of gazing upon men in a lustful manner. As a woman, if you lust after a man, if you look at them in a lustful manner, you have already committed adultery in your heart. As a woman, or as a man rather, if you, if you look upon a woman in a lustful manner, you've already committed adultery in your heart. This is according to Jesus here. Okay? This is according to Jesus here. So when Jesus says to look here, the word that's used here in the Greek for the word look there, it means to set the heart upon. Okay? To set the heart upon. That is to long for, to covet, to desire, to lust after. Okay, so when you look upon a person and you begin to long for them, you begin to imagine yourself being with them. You begin to think about all the things that you can do to them physically. You begin to focus on the way their body looks. You begin to focus on the way their facial features look. You are now in a place that's illicit. In your mind, you are having fantasies. In your mind, you are now bringing your mind to a place of perversion that is now infiltrating your heart and you are spiritually committing adultery with a person before you ever commit the physical act of adultery. The physical act of adultery is the byproduct or the manifestation of the spiritual act or acts of adultery that have already occurred in a person's life. What do I mean by that? People that are governed and driven by lust, they commit adultery in their heart every time they lust after people. Therefore, it's easy for them to then commit the physical act of adultery. This is why the enemy attacks marriages in this manner because he understands this principle all too well. This is an age-old tactic that he's been using for years to cause people to fail, 
to cause people to, 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 to fall, to cause people to enter into a place of ruin, to, dis, uh, to dismantle families, to break the will of God, to, to divide what God has put together. Now, when we see that scripture, he says, what, 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 what God has put together, let no man uh, put asunder. Oftentimes, we can divide or we can break up our own families. We can break up our own marriages based upon our own sinful lifestyles. It's not God doing it. It's not the devil forcing us to do anything. We have to make a decision to agree with God or degree or agree with Satan regarding anything in existence. So whoever you agree with, you are going to experience the consequences or the fruit of that kingdom. Again, whoever you agree with, whether it's God, whether it's Satan, whoever you agree with, you are going to eat or experience the fruit of that kingdom. So if you agree with the flesh, you're going to eat the fruit of the flesh. If you agree with God, you're going to eat the fruit of the spirit. If you agree with sin, you are going to eat the fruit of wickedness, corruption. If you agree with righteousness, you are going to eat the good of the land. You're going to eat the blessings of God. You're going to eat and live in that place of abundant living. So we have to ask ourselves this question, how do we overcome this? First and foremost, spiritual amputation. Somebody say spiritual amputation. Spiritual amputation. What does that mean? Now let's think about this naturally. In the context of an amputation that, 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 that uh, one can experience in their natural body, normally um, a, a limb is ampu uh, amputated uh, when it gets to a place to where it is no longer living, it's infected, and it can actually um, function in a way to where it can threaten the life of the individual. Okay? So that's normally what causes amputations to occur. All right. So here in this context, using that same principle in a natural standpoint, let's look at it spiritually. Spiritual amputation. We have to understand that there are certain things that we can give ourselves to that are designed to harm us, that are designed to kill us, that are designed to kill our purposes in God, that are designed to kill our families, our relationships, you know, and a vast multitude of things that are designed to kill the momentum that God is establishing in our lives for his glory. So the way that we overcome is first and foremost by spiritual amputation. Jesus says it this way. He says, if your right eye causes you to sin, pluck it out and cast it far from you. For it is more profitable for you that one of your members perish than for your whole body to be cast into hell. That talks about the destruction of the entire being. He says, if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and cast it from you. For it is more profitable for you that one of your members per perish than for your whole body to be cast into hell. So Jesus is saying that whatever is causing you to sin, you need to cut it off from your life. Whatever is causing you to sin, cut it off from your life. Because it's better for you to lose that thing than for you to lose your life. It's better for you to, to lose that thing by you making a decision to cut it off as opposed to you now having to be cut off from eternal fellowship with God by way of God's eternal judgment against the sin that you did not deal with in your life. God wants his people whole and set free. We overcome by the word of God. Somebody say the word of God. We overcome by the word of God. Psalm chapter 119 verses 9 through 16 says this. How can a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed according to your word. With my whole heart have I sought you. Oh, let me not wander from your commandments. Your word I have hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you. Blessed are you, O Lord. Teach me your statutes. With my lips I have declared all the judgments of your mouth. I have rejoiced in the way of your testimonies as much as in all riches. I will, watch this, I will meditate on your precepts and contemplate your ways. I will delight myself in your statutes. I will not forget your word. We have to learn how to hide God's word in our heart. When you hide the word of God in your heart, it gives you the ability to overcome sin. The psalmist here understood this principle. He said, he asked a rhetorical question. He said, how can a man cleanse his way? 
And then he provides the answer by taking heed according to your word. We cleanse our way when we heed the word of the Lord. What does it mean to heed the word of the Lord? It means to pay careful attention to the word of the Lord, to embrace and receive the word of the Lord with the purpose of walking in obedience to God's word. When you heed the way of the or heed the word of the Lord, when you live your life according to God's word, what ends up happening is that you end up cleansing your way because the word of God has the ability to wash us. The word of God has the ability to cleanse us. The word of God has the ability to purify us. The word of God has the ability to sanctify us. So we need to hide the word in our heart. When you hide the, when you hide God's word in your heart, you are doing this in a way to where you are safeguarding God's word in your heart because you understand the value, the purpose, the potency and the power of God's word. When you understand the value, the purpose, and the potency and the power of God's word, you are now positioned in a way to use God's word as a weapon of war. You are positioned to use God's word as an instrument that brings you into a place of divine fortification and deliverance. We have to value the word of God. We have to learn how to meditate on God's word. Now, when I'm saying meditate here, let me be very clear. I'm not talking about this strange stuff that people are doing now. This stuff that's rooted in new age thought the stuff that that's rooted in in various forms of witchcraft and spiritism candomblé and, and and santeria and different types of yoruba practices and eastern mysticism and kabbalah and merkaba mysticism and all this stuff listen i'm not talking about that when i'm talking about meditation i'm speaking of biblical meditation where you are reading the word of god out loud and you are speaking to god and you are conversing with god concerning his word you begin to recite God's word aloud. You begin to pray the word of God aloud. You begin to meditate and ponder upon the word. This is all a part of meditation in a biblical context. So we meditate on the word of God, meaning we set our mind, we direct our mind and our attention, the faculties of our mind to the word of God. When you do this, transformation begins to hit your mind. When you do this, your mind is now being renewed based upon your ability to meditate on God's word. The word of God is life. The word of God is living. The word of God is active. The word of God is powerful. The word of God can cause you to change and be transformed into Christ's glorious image. We have to learn how to delight ourselves in the word of God. The word of God is not something that is dreadful. The word of God is not something that is boring. You have to learn how to delight yourself in the word of God because you have to know that when you are truly meditating on God's word, you are opening yourself up to encounter God. It is a delightful thing to meditate on the word of God. The word of God can function in the likeness of medicine to your soul. The word of God can function in the likeness of divine empowerment that establishes you and fortifies you internally so that you are able and you are equipped to overcome the tests of life that will come against you at the different appointed times of life there are seasons of life that will challenge you and if you do not have the word of God in your heart you will not be able to stand there are different situations in life that may rise up many afflictions that may come upon you that will try to shake your faith if you do not have the word of God in your heart you have nothing to reflect upon you have nothing to use. You have no weaponry to speak or to wield against the enemy when he comes against you. Jesus was able to say it is written because he had a reservoir of God's word built up on the inside of him. You can't say it is written if you don't know the word of God. What are you going to say? It, it's written what? What my mama said? What my daddy said? What the pastor taught me? That's not going to work for you. We overcome by living life according to the renewed mind. Somebody say the renewed mind. We need a renewed mind. Some of the things that we encounter, it's because our minds have not been renewed. Some of the petty things that we do, it's because our minds have not been renewed. I want to give you this scripture once again. I gave it to you earlier. Romans chapter 12 verses 1 through 2. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. 
Now, the word conform there, it means to be shaped or fashioned after the pattern or the likeness of another. The word transform there, it means to take on a state of transfiguration. It's the Greek word metamorpho. metamorpho. It means to take on a state of transfiguration. So the renewing of the mind according to the word of God, it brings you into a place of divine transfiguration where your mind and your character and your life becomes transfigured into the image of God, into the image of Christ. This is why our mind needs to be renewed. Let me give you another scripture here. See, we have to understand that the renewed mind brings us into a place to where we experience the power of God in a way that transforms our lives from a place of carnality into a place of victory. So God wants to transition his people from carnality to victory. God wants to transition his people from carnality to victory over carnality so that we can produce godly fruit that pleases the Father. That's God's will for you. Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3 verse 1 says this. If then you were raised with Christ, seek those things which are above where Christ is, sitting at the right hand of God. Now the Apostle Paul starts by asking a rhetorical question here. He says, if then you have been raised with Christ, or he positions this statement in a way to where he, he's making it known to you. He's saying, if then, in other words, in consideration of the fact that you have been raised with Christ, there is a corresponding action that needs to take place. There's a corresponding action that you need to consider. There's a certain posture that you need to embody because of your new position in him. So if then you were raised with Christ to what? To the newness of life. To a new from a from a place of death to a place of life and triumphant victory over sin right he says if then you've been raised with christ do what seek those things which are above seek that means to set your heart after to set your mind after to pursue to seek to find out with the purpose of obtaining seek those things which are above where christ is and then he gives us the locality where christ is sitting at the right hand of god that's the highest place of authority spiritually. That's a place of honor. That's a place of victory. That's a place of authority. Seek those things. So the Bible reveals to us that we have been blessed with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places where? In Christ. We've been blessed with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. So though, in order for us to obtain the revelation of those blessings, we have to seek those things which are above. You can't obtain the revelation of the blessings that you have in Christ if you're not seeking them. He says, set your mind on the things above, not on the things on the earth. Again, he's placing the responsibility on us. Set our minds on the things above, not on the things on the earth. For you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ who is our life appears, then you also will appear with him in glory that deals with glorification okay so i want to back up here for a moment set your mind on the things above not on the things on the earth that deals with two different realms of existence the things above are spiritual things the things on the earth are carnal things so he says set your mind on spiritual things and not carnal things okay set your mind on spiritual things and not carnal things let's keep reading then not only does he say this he says therefore put to death your members which are on the earth again on the earth that deals with carnal things what are the members that are on the earth fornication uncleanness passion evil desire and covetousness which is idolatry because of these things the wrath of god is coming upon who the sons of disobedience in which you yourselves once walked when you lived in them so the sons of disobedience is dealing with the specific grouping of people that deals with Satan, that deals with demons, and that deals with unbelievers who have rejected Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. So he says the wrath of God because of these things, because of uh, sin, because of these carnal things, the wrath of God is coming upon the sons of disobedience. And then he says you yourselves used to be in that category, but now there has been a change. You are no longer in that state and condition because of your faith in Jesus Christ. So because of this change, because of the fact that you've been raised with Christ, he then goes on to say, Put off all of these things. 
anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy language out of your mouth. Anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy language out of your mouth. So God tells us to put off these things. And then he says, do not lie to one another since you have put off the old man with his deeds and have put on who? The new man who is renewed in knowledge according to the image of him who created him. Where there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcised nor uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave nor free, but Christ is all and in all. So he says, put off the old man with what? With his deeds. Put off the old man with his deeds. God bless you, Apostle Chris. It's good to see you, sir. He says, put off the old man with his deeds. And he says, put on the new man who is renewed in the knowledge according or renewed in knowledge according to the image of him who created him. That's what we are to be doing in this hour if we are going to overcome. You have to set your mind. There are certain things that you, you have to set your mind on Christ and the things above. You have to seek those things. You have to put off certain things from you, meaning you have to cast away those things. You have to get rid of those things and you have to embrace and put on your new identity in Jesus Christ. That's the regenerated identity and framework that God has given to you. If you're going to overcome lust, sexual immorality, you have to live a spirit-filled and a spirit-led life. Somebody say, I have to live a spirit-filled and a spirit-led life. There's no other way around it. Let me give you this last scripture here and then we're going to pray. Galatians chapter number 5, verses 16 through 26. Is this blessing you? I pray that this is blessing you and ministering to you and strengthening you. Galatians chapter 5, verses 16 through 26. It says this. I say then walk in the spirit and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. So Paul says walk in the spirit. To walk in the spirit means to live your life according to the Holy Spirit's empowerment. Okay, so you walk in the spirit and you will not what? Bring to completion the lust of the flesh. The word fulfill there means to bring to completion or to bring to an expected end or outcome. Okay, he says for the flesh lust against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh and these are contrary to one another so that you do not do the things that you wish but if you were led by the spirit you are not under the law now the works of the flesh are what evident meaning that they are plainly seen which are adultery fornication uncleanness lewdness idolatry sorcery hatred contentions jealousies outbursts of wrath selfish ambitions dissensions heresies envy murders drunkenness revelries and the like so when he says and the like he's not saying that this grouping here is an exhaustive listing he's saying that these are some of the things as well as anything like this anything that functions in a similar fashion anything that functions in the context of the unfruitful works of darkness he's saying that these things are evident meaning that they are plainly seen for all to see he says, of which I tell you beforehand, just as I also told you in time past, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit, somebody say the fruit of the Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. And those who were Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Mm -hmm. If we live in the spirit, let us also walk in the spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another and envying one another. And those who are Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. The evidence or the thing that validates your relationship with Jesus Christ is the crucifixion of the flesh. It's your consistent, deliberate effort as the Spirit of God leads you and empowers you to mortify the flesh, to mortify the unfruitful deeds of the body. That serves as evidence that we are yielded and submitted to the Lordship of Christ. That serves as evidence that the Spirit of God is on the inside of us that serves as evidence 
that the Spirit of the Lord is moving on the inside of us and transforming our character, sanctifying our souls. We have to crucify our flesh daily. So what does this mean for the person that misses the mark? What does this mean for the person that sins, the person that does not walk in perfection in this area? Does that mean that your life is over? Does that mean that uh, you, you were just written off from God and you are unredeemable? Absolutely not. The grace of God functions on our behalf to literally cause us to be renewed, to be restored, to be forgiven, and to then be subsequently empowered to go and sin no more. That's the grace of God. See, an example of the grace of God in action through Jesus Christ is when we look at the biblical account of the adulterous woman and how this woman, she was accused of adultery. And so Jesus comes on the scene here. And so now Jesus has to deal with two issues here. He has to deal with the hypocritical accusers that are trying to stone this woman. But then he doesn't just stop there. He says, he who is out, who, who's without sin cast the first stone, right? So obviously none of them were without sin. Therefore, they put their stones down. So Jesus would eventually get to a point within that conversation with her to where he would then say, where are your accusers? And then he would go on to say, go and sin no more. He says, you've been forgiven. He says, go and sin no more. Jesus was dealing with the hypocrisy of the accusers, which was sin, but he was also dealing with the sin of the woman and saying, go and sin no more. The grace of God applies a balanced approach to sin. The grace of God deals with sin while also preserving the life of the individual. The grace of God deals with sin while also teaching and empowering the individual how to live a godly life how to live a righteous life, how to live a purified life. That's what the grace of God does in and through us. I think unfortunately we've embraced an improper view of the grace of God. We've relegated the grace of God to unmerited favor only. Prophet Dantrell, God bless you, man, my brother. Good to see you. We've relegated the grace of God to unmerited favor only. And so when we do this, unfortunately, we create an environment to where the grace functions as a pass. It, 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 like it functions in a way to give us a pass in relationship to certain things that we may be doing uh, that, quite frankly, are not upright before God. And I think this opens the door for the grace of God to become abused, to become misidentified, misinterpreted, misapplied. And I think this is one of the things that has happened, which has now caused people to become extremely legalistic uh, because they have seen a, 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 an extreme misapplication of the grace of God. The grace of God was never designed to condone our sin. The grace of God was never designed to, to, to keep us in this repetitive cycle of living in sin just so that we can experience the grace of God. The Apostle Paul deals with this in Romans chapter 6. He says, shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? He says, God forbid. We don't continue in sin so that we can experience the super abounding grace of God. Because prior to that point, he said, where sin aboundeth, grace aboundeth much more. Meaning that grace super abounds, right? So we don't, we don't live in sin and then use grace as a cover-up for our sinful actions. We don't live in sin or commit acts of sin and then say, well, we have grace for that. That's not the purpose of God's grace. God's grace has the ability to function in our lives as a teacher. The grace of God has the ability to function in our lives as an instructor, to teach us who God is and empower us to walk upright before Him. I'll show it to you. Titus chapter 2 verse 11 For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to who? To all men Teaching us that denying ungodliness 
and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in the present age, looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify for himself his own special people, zealous for good works. Then he says, speak these things, exhort and rebuke with all authority. Let no one despise you. Right? So the grace of God functions as a teacher. Teaching us. Teaching us what? That denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live how? Soberly, righteously, and godly in this present age. The grace of God teaches you to deny ungodliness and worldly lust while also teaching you to live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present age. That's important because if you look at the world around you, there are so many things that, this, that are being promoted in this present age that are anti-Christ in nature. There are so many things that are being promoted by the culture, the systems, powers, people, individuals, uh, that exist in the world that are demonically inspired they're promoting these things that are designed to lead people down a pathway of darkness as believers we have to know how to live soberly we have to know how to live righteously we have to know how to live godly if we do not know how to live soberly righteously or godly we will take the bait and we will become deceived and instead of denying ungodliness and worldly lusts we will have fellowship with ungodliness and worldly lust. The word fellowship oftentimes in the New Testament is the Greek word koinonia, which means joint participation. We'll find ourselves functioning as joint participants in ungodliness and worldly lust. That's a dangerous place to be in as a believer. All right. So I want to pray for you. If this message has impacted you, if this message has helped you and strengthened you, I want to pray for you. If you've identified with anything that has been taught during this broadcast, I want to pray for you. Because I know that God is going to move mightily. He's already moving mightily. I just see very clearly what there, for many of you, there are, there are shackles and chains that are breaking off of you. And for many of you, your eyes are being opened. Your eyes are being opened to see who you truly are in Him. And to see God's purpose, purpose and His perfect will for your life. Just right where you are, just lift your hands to God and just begin to say, Lord, I surrender. Just begin to say, Lord, I surrender. Lord, I surrender. Lord, I surrender to you. Lord, I surrender to your will. I surrender to your way. I surrender to you. Just lift your voice and say, Lord, I surrender. Lord, I surrender. Lord, I surrender. As you lift your voice and you surrender to God, God's going to begin to move on the inside of you. He's going to begin to move on the inside of you. God is moving. God is moving. God is moving. He's moving, he's moving, he's moving. Father, in Jesus' name, I thank you for moving in the hearts and the minds of your people. I thank you for delivering. I thank you for setting them free now. In Jesus' name, I bind and rebuke every attack that would come against them. In the context of lust, in the context of sexual impurity, I cancel the assignment of the enemy to steal, kill, and destroy from their lives now in Jesus' name. Father, I pray that you would purify I release now the power, the fire of the Holy Ghost to move on the inside in the name of Jesus. Move on the inside, move on the inside, move on the inside. Consume, consume now in the name of Jesus. Consume now in the name of Jesus. Consume now, consume now, consume now. Consume now, consume now. Purify their appetites now, God. In the name of Jesus, right where you are, I just hear this very clearly. I want you to repeat this after me. I want you to repeat this after me. Say, Lord, I renounce every connection to illicit, sinful, sexual activity in the name of Jesus. Say, Lord, I sever every covenant, every contract, and every soul tie that I've come into agreement with and established in my life. In Jesus Christ's name. 
Lord Jesus, I ask that you would cleanse and purify my heart, my mind, and my soul in Jesus Christ's mighty name. Lord Jesus, I ask that you would purify my body in the name of Jesus Christ. Now just take a moment and just receive that right there. Take a moment and just receive that right there. For some of you, you are feeling literally in your body. Your body feels like heat. Your body feels like electricity. You're feeling this freedom and this peace that you've never felt before. For some of you, you're feeling this, this, this peace, this freedom. You feel this weight and this burden being lifted from off of you. I see where the hand of God is lifting the burdens from off of you. For many of you, this has been a burden. You desire to be free, but you don't know how to be free. And the Lord is saying that this is your hour of visitation. I declare and decree that this is your hour of visitation, your hour of breakthrough, your hour of healing, your hour of deliverance. And it is so in Jesus Christ's mighty name. Just receive it right there. Father, in Jesus' name, I thank you for every person that's here, every family, every household, every ministry that's represented. Father, I pray that you would continue to strengthen your people, continue to move on the inside of them now in the name of Jesus. Continue to empower them to produce fruit that brings you glory and honor in the name of Jesus. For some of you, your dream life has been infiltrated by illicit sexual encounters. And so I want to just pray here just for a moment. Father, in Jesus' name, for every person that's been attacked in their dreams through sexual dreams that were perverse in nature, I cancel the assignment of the enemy in Jesus Christ's mighty name. I loose now the fire of God into those places and into those spaces in their minds, in their souls, in their homes. And Father, I pray that you would purify, that you would fight for them, that you would fortify them, that you would cover them and keep them in the name of Jesus. I command, I command it to break now in Jesus' name. Command it to break now in Jesus' name. I thank you for the victory now. Every false image, I command it to fall to the ground now in Jesus' name. Every image that's used for idolatry, I command it to fall to the ground now in Jesus' name. I declare and decree that you are free. No longer will you battle in your mind. No longer will you battle in your thoughts. No longer will you battle in your dreams. I plead the blood of Jesus over their minds now. And Lord, I thank you for moving. I thank you for healing. I thank you for delivering. I thank you for setting them free. In the name of Jesus. God, we thank you for your freedom. Just begin to thank God for freedom. Begin to thank God for victory. Listen, as you all leave this broadcast, it's important that now you fill yourself with the Word of God. It's important that you fill yourself with the Word of God, that you build yourself in the Word of God. Okay? And so what I encourage you to do is begin to look up scriptures. Begin to look up scriptures that deal with purity, that deal with freedom, uh, freedom and victory from lust and things of that nature and begin to build your life begin to build yourself up in the word of God I encourage you that as you leave this broadcast take a moment take some time to just begin to worship God and to just bask in his presence take some time to worship him take some time to just sit there in stillness and silence before the Lord and allow the Lord allow the spirit of the living God to minister to you there is more deliverance and breakthrough that God wants to initiate in your lives apart from this public space. And so this requires your obedience to pursue God in your own intimate spaces, in your own intimate places. And when you do this, you will encounter God in a greater measure and in a greater capacity. 
the tingling, the tingling, the fire. The hand of the Lord is resting upon you. Nakia Jefferson, the hand of the Lord is resting upon you. Fill it to overflowing in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. God, we bless you. God, we honor you. So listen, thank each and every one of you for joining and, and just uh, allowing me to share the word of the Lord with you. Again, I encourage you to just take some time out and just meditate on God and just worship him. I just see where the Lord is going to minister to you in a greater capacity. So again, God wants you to be free. God wants you to be sanctified. God wants you to be empowered to produce fruit that brings him glory and honor. All right? Until next time, may God's grace and peace be with all of you. And I pray that you have a blessed and wonderful night, morning, uh, evening, wherever you guys are in the world. God blessing. God bless you.